go after you. Thank you, Lord, for this worship service today that sets our heart in motion to uh, connect with you in a deeper and abiding way. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to inspire us, whether at home or in person, that we might draw close to you. And Lord, I pray at this time that you will use this sermon to bless us. And I pray, gracious God, that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth will bring you praise, O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we are continuing, I'm continuing the sermon series on worst year ever. And the whole idea that we are trying to find a way to confront our adversity and the things in our life that shake us up and challenge us. And I think from the children's sermon that we had today, uh, we didn't actually talk amongst ourselves about what the sermon was going to be about, but it really does tie in very well that sometimes our adversities are self pause Sometimes we put up blocks and sometimes we try to keep people away or we try to keep our own ideology in and we don't want anybody to challenge that. And so we sometimes get smothered by our own piousness, our own religiosity, our own things that we think are right and, uh, and then other people are wrong. And so we build those blocks, we build those walls, and it can really, really undo us. And so that's a really interesting segue into our lesson for today. How many people here have read the book of Job? If you've read the book of Job, please raise your hand at home, raise your hand high, okay? It's a really fascinating story, the book of Job. For it tells us about a wager between God and the devil, the accuser. And God believes that Job is the most righteous person to ever live. Matter of fact, let me just read to you some of the scripture. Uh, so if you read Job 1 and 2 chapters, they're very quick. It takes you five minutes to read them both. And then you can go into the rest of the story. But let me just kind of read to you, just that, since a lot of you haven't read it, it starts off this way. There was once a man named Job, named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had many sons and daughters. He had sheep, camels, oxen, female donkeys, and service and servants. He was the richest person in the area. And so one day, members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. And Satan replies, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear the Lord. You have put a, up a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, the Lord says, you may test him. Do whatever you want, but don't uh, harm him physically. And so the whole book of Job is this contest between God and the accuser, or God and Satan, to see who, uh, if Job is going to fall away from faith. And so it's this wonderful story of how Job lifts up his faith in God in his dire circumstances. And so Job uh, ultimately loses his children, he loses his cattle, his sheep, his servants, he loses everything. And we find another time in which the accuser comes back and Job uh, is still a righteous man of faith. And so the devil brings him boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And he's in agony and physical pain. And still he does not curse the Lord. But he starts to get kind of, why me? Why do all these bad things happen to me? Oh my gosh, why are you doing this, oh God? And so, enter Job's three friends. He's got three friends named, <laughs> great names for your pets, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz. <laughs> and these three friends come up to tell him, Job, surely you must have done something wrong to deserve this. 
But Job was going, I didn't do anything wrong. I can't think of anything that I could possibly have done wrong. And they said, well, surely you're not paying attention. Obviously, God is not going to do these bad things to you unless you <laughs> deserve it. And so these three fans, uh, friends, if you read, there's like 40 chapters in Job. And so they spend many chapters telling Job, surely you have mistaken. And Job keeps defending himself and his faith, saying, I've done nothing wrong. But then he turns to God, and he doesn't lose his faith. He doesn't curse God, but he starts to whine to God. Why do you do these things to me? I can't believe you cause all of these bad things to happen to me. After all of the good that I've done for you, why do you continue to allow me to suffer? And so Job's attitude begins to change because he loses everything that's important to him. He loses his, his sons and his daughters, and he loses all of his property and his wealth. He doesn't curse God, but he starts to, well, why are you doing this to me? And uh, being accusatory to God. But he doesn't curse God. And so enter this interesting character, Elihu, whom was, that was read to you today from chapter 33. Elihu is this interesting character. We don't really know if he was one of Job's friends or not, but he comes in, scholars believe, he came in to prepare Job for the theophany, for the presence of God. And so what he does is he tells Job, reminds Job how wonderful God is. And so he does this, he, 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 his feet. And, and so Job listens to him, and, uh, and then God responds. And God responds to Job by not answering him, by not saying, well, this is why I did all these bad things to you. God says, I am the maker of heaven and earth. How dare you even talk to me that way? I can do whatever I want. And that's kind of hard to hear for us people of faith. We want God to coddle us, don't we? I like to be possible. I don't know about you. If I ever get sick, bring me food. Bring me cookies. I like to be coddled. But in this conversation, God is not coddling Job, but he is speaking and addressing to him. And Job responds by saying, oh, thank you, God, for at least responding, for at least talking to me. I know that you are real now, are more real than I had forgotten that you were during the midst of my suffering. And he, can, he praises God, he lifts God up, and God says something really interesting. He says to all of Job's friends that they were wrong, that they completely misunderstood what was going on. Now, you have to understand, Job's friends used religious language to tell him, well, surely you've done something wrong to God. And they spiritualized his situation to, to help him, bring him closer to God. But we find in the end that everything they said was wrong. If you go back and read Job, it's fascinating. You go, wow, this stuff is really good. Especially if you're raised in church, surely you've heard people talk to you that way. Hmm. And you go, well, this is, and, but then God says in the end that they were all wrong. Job and his friends never knew about this divine wager between the accuser and God. There are things that go on in our lives that we will never know the answer to. There are things in life that we will never know why we got cancer. There will be times in our life that we don't know why we lost our job, why we kind of lost our will to, to go on. There are things that happen to us that are beyond our ability to understand or control. What's the answer? The answer is learning to rest in God. To say, well, I don't understand why all this is happening to me, but I trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord always, and again, I will trust. It's learning to be able to do that without needing a, a, a reason for it. As we grow in our faith, we need to learn to realize that just resting in God and trusting in God for your future, whatever happens in your life, is enough. When we're young, we've got to have all the answers. We've got to say, well, gosh, you've got to tell me what's going on. I need to know why this is happening to me. But as you grow older, you just kind of go, I don't know. There are things that I cannot possibly know. But today, I will trust in the Lord. I speak with a lot of older folks who come to me and say, who testify to the greatness and the power of God. And I remember talking to many who say to me, 
I don't really know what the future holds, but today I'm going to trust in the Lord. It's getting to that point in our faith where we don't need to know everything, but to know that God is enough. And yet, sometimes, when we see bad things happening to other people, we want to give our reasoning as to why bad things are happening to them. Or we want to say really pithy spiritual things to make them feel better, like Job's friends tried to do. And sometimes we end up saying things that alienate and harm the soul of the person who's going through suffering. And we need to, I don't know, we need to not do that. So I've got a friend of mine, I've got these two friends of mine, uh, they're both ministers and they're, they're lovely people, and uh, they were on Facebook yesterday. Now, a lot of you were perhaps on Facebook yesterday. Some of you were celebrating. Some of you were in dismay about the election results. And so one of my friends is a rabbi. And he's, a, he's a great guy, and he's retired. And, uh, and he was telling my other friend, who's a minister, you need to not gloat. Because he's a, a, a very big anti-Trump fan. And he's a pastor, and he's not afraid to tell somebody, you can't possibly be a Christian if you vote that way. Which is just horrible, right? It's just horrible. And so the rabbi said, you just, you don't, you should not gloat in this time. Because you're going to be offending people who are in your flock. <laughs> and it's interesting how we respond to our joys and concerns. Sometimes we want to gloat. Sometimes we want to be happy when we should just be still. That we can just trust in the Lord for your presence and for God's guidance in our life. But the minute we step into the situation and start pointing our fingers, we become like Job's friends. That no matter how helpful they thought they were, they were not helpful at all. They did not help Job at all. They, <clears throat> we need to be careful with how we say what we say and when we say it. In all circumstances, we need to be able to rest in God's presence and know that that is enough. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Am I talking too much? I'm trying not to be political here, but certainly our politics have divided our nation so significantly that we have built the walls. And what if we just didn't do that? What if we found a way to unite one another with God and with peace? I know it's hard to do. I know it's hard to do. I'm on Facebook too. <laughs> and so yesterday, I was fortunate and blessed enough to do a wedding up in North Jersey. I, I agreed to do it uh, months and months ago. And so I was not on Facebook. I mean, I posted, I think, in the morning and at night. And I tried not to get involved in all of the talk mm -hmm. and just tried to step away from it because half of my friends are Republican and half of my friends are Democrat. And they are my dearest friends on earth. And so I know how they think both sides and I wanted to be a person of faith and encouragement and not get in the midst of that verbal garbage. Even celebratory verbal garbage. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, we need to be careful with how we say what we say uh, and then learn to trust in God for our futures. There's this fellow by the name of Horatio Spafford who, a lot like Job, had the world fall in on him. Spafford was the author of the well-known hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. We're going to sing that in just a moment. He worked as a Christian, Christian businessman in Chicago Losing his son to sickness and then losing much of his financial assets in the Chicago Fire of 1871, he thought that he'd been through a lot, but like Job, his suffering was not over. In 1873, he planned a trip to Europe for his family, hoping for some respite. Some unexpected business came up at the last minute, and he decided to stay behind and follow his wife and daughters after a couple of days. On the way, his family's boat was struck by an English ship and sank. His wife cabled him from Europe saying, saved alone. Upon receiving the news, Spafford immediately sailed overseas to meet his wife and wrote this hymn in the place where he presumed his daughters had perished. 
While feeling the overwhelm of grief and allowing his sadness to wash over him, he turned to worship and trust God in the midst of his sorrow. It wasn't easy, but Safford chose to see in this immense suffering as a gift of refining in the fire and opportunity for growth. The words he penned in his famous hymn sum up this when he wrote, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Those words reflect a lot of what Job said when Job first experienced his uh, losing everything. He says, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. How on earth can people experience such tragedy and distress, call upon the name of the Lord when all they have is gone? How can they lose everything and still find a way to praise God? That's what a person of faith looks like. That's what a person of faith is. Someone who in the midst of your calamity, you can still turn to God and trust in God. God wants us to be that way. And we should do the best that we can to live the kind of way that no matter what year we're having, no matter what we're going through, we can have the faith to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Many of you last week agreed to participate in the 30-day uh, challenge of gratitude. If you are participating in the 30-day challenge of gratitude, would you raise your hand here at home? I, 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 I see you. <laughs> but... There's a lot of you who are doing this. You're posting your gratitude on Facebook. You're posting three things that you're thankful for every day. You're getting yourself into the mindset of being thankful, even in the midst of all the stresses in your life. This is a wonderful exercise and a wonderful opportunity to be a person of faith like Job, to be a person of faith like Horatio Stafford. But in the midst of all their suffering, they still put their faith and hope and trust in God, even when things don't go the way they hoped they would go. I pray that you will be a person of faith, that you will do the best that you can, that you will strive to be the kind of faith that is a rock that believes in God no matter what happens or befalls. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for your words of life to us and what they teach us. They teach us to have faith, not the kind of faith